from the Daily Mail. Exclusive. Is this the proof that Ilhan Omar married her own brother to bypass U.S. immigration rules? Conservative group's DNA test from Congresswoman's cigarette butt purports to show 99.99% match to her second husband, Ahmed Almi. And so they show this photo of Ilhan Omar smoking a cigarette. And I guess that's suppo- like supposed to be proof that big tent Republican PAC, I guess, secured the cigarette after the fact and then did a DNA test on it. And then you end up with this DNA sibling ship report, which is claiming, what do they say? It's like a 99. What are, okay, okay, they say the result of the test assert that there is a 99 point. Oh, man, I'm going to read this. 9999998% chance that Omar and her second husband, Ahmed Elmi, are siblings. The report drawn up by Endeavor DNA Laboratories does not name either Omar or Elmi, instead referring to them as sibling one and sibling two. It says that sibling one sample was garnered from a cigarette butt and, and sibling two is from a drinking straw. You know what's really funny is that we talked about this like a, a year uh, yeah. or so ago where it was like we were, we were joking because there's an episode of Law & Order where like they're trying to bust this guy and the, he, they can't get the evidence and then he drinks from a coffee and then throws the cup in the dumpster or like into a trash and they walk up and pick it up with like tongs and they're like discarded materials and they're like hey you can't do that and then they get the DNA evidence and I was like what if somebody just like found an old snot rag and then ran DNA and proved it I'm not I'm not sure I believe you know people went out and actually did this I'm not I, I think it's kind of outlandish I don't know what else someone would do like if you're trying to prove this but I'll tell you where it's it really really crazy Here's what they say. The test was posted online by Anton Lazaro, a Republican strategist in Minneapolis on Wednesday. Around 12 hours later, Lazaro was arrested on federal child trafficking charges. Or I'm sorry, it doesn't say, it doesn't say child. On, uh, I'm being careful because it's YouTube. Trafficking. But they, they did say under 18 uh, was, was part of it. So it's trap. Yeah. Oh, no, okay. It does say child. Right. Child trafficking, people under 18. <laughs> He's currently, he is now in custody awaiting a hearing on Monday. I wonder how many people are screaming it's a conspiracy. He was about to bust Elhan Omar, mm-hmm. or maybe he's a shady guy and he does shady things, and this is complete BS evidence. I guess outside of any of these DNA claims, there's circumstantial evidence that leads many people to believe she married her brother because it was uh, it was it was to get him in the country, right? Yeah, it was an immigration thing, and then he got to go to school, and so. You have multiple layers of potential fraud in terms of the immigration fraud, the student loan fraud, and probably other misrepresentation as well. And the circumstantial evidence is very compelling here. Let's let's jump to that. But first, I want to show people, listen, I am, I am not saying I know anything definitively. I'm saying people have made these assertions. There have been bits of circumstantial evidence to the point that Star Tribune, a Pulitzer Prize winning paper reported in June 20, on, on June 23rd, 2019, New documents revisit questions about Rep. Ilhan Omar's marriage history. Although she has legally corrected the discrepancy, she has declined to say anything about how or why it happened. They say, new investigative documents released by a state agency have given fresh life to lingering questions about the marital history of Rep. Ilhan Omar and whether she once married a man, possibly her own brother, to skirt immigration laws. Now, if, if there was, I'll say this, either Star Tribune is extremely reckless by saying it was possibly her brother, or there is circumstantial evidence many people have seen which say, yeah, that might have been her brother, right? And also the Star Tribune is sort of the House Democrat Party paper in the area. They were very favorable towards Elon Omar the whole way. I mean, she was like the perfect progressive uh, sort of avatar for Minneapolis. So yeah, you go in, you can look at the marriage certificate, you can look at the addresses that she was living in with the alleged brother husband at the same time her actual husband was living in like the same place. You know, you can run through all of these different threads. Two things jump out at me though, and one of the reasons I wrote this book is because the brother husband thing was like the least of the potential issues that I saw in her. I said, if you actually look at her on the merits, the regressive ideology that she harbors, the fact that she was sitting on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, which she still sits on, and if you applied the Russian collusion standard or any collusion standard, her links, ties, coordination with foreign adversaries. What I found and sort of the starting point for the book was she has ties to Erdogan in Turkey, substantial ties. When she was a state legislator, she had a meeting with Erdogan on the sideline of the UN General Assembly. What state legislator from Minnesota has a... Remember when she said uh, we should sanction Israel 
because of human rights abuses, but then said sanctioning Turkey would be a human rights abuse. A lot of people were Did, like, hey. Does she know. speak the language, Turkish? She doesn't. I don't believe she speaks the language, but she is featured in Turkish state media hmm. all the time. She's had meetings with several dignitaries from Turkey, always taking a pro-Turkish line. Turkey has relations with, close relations with Somalia, so I do think that that is a part of this as well, that she is pro-Turkish in large part because of that. And that's not even to get into, like, all of the domestic Islamist groups and individuals, you know, and... The anti-Semitism? So... Oh, yeah, that we didn't even get to that. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. So this is what, what, what bugs me about... Uh, this is, and this is uh, a problem with the Democratic Party at, at large. Ilhan Omar did what I would refer to as crop-dusting anti-Semitism. You know, like, crop-duster planes get, like, real close to the ground, but they don't touch it? Mm -hmm. So she was saying, like, you know, she said it's all about the Benjamins. She said, you know, multiple, like, dual loyalties and stuff like that. And those are typically more, more th those tropes are used more aggressively in direct anti-Semitic attacks. So she didn't directly make it about being Jewish, but she, you know, she crop dusted the ideas and it got a lot of people angry. And instead of doing anything about it, the multiple things, and more than just, you know, that, a lot of people think she was overtly anti-Semitic. They just say, we're going to denounce all forms of bigotry and she's allowed to keep her positions and do whatever she wants. The Republicans would set their own on fire in two seconds, like they've done with Marjorie Taylor Greene. It was, uh, was it Steve King, I think? Mm -hmm. He made that tweet about white nationalism. They kicked him out immediately and then he lost his primary. Because Republicans are like, we don't want none of that. The Democrats, though, they're like, who cares? You know, when I'll tell you this, it's because of the media. Because, and that's, uh, there's another thing here, it's why Republicans care more about the opinion of the New York Times than the opinion of their constituents. Because the Republicans know if they, if they fart, it'll be the, the headline paper on the New York Times. And the Democrats know they can do and say basically anything and the papers will not cover you it. You got AOC being able to tweet, tweet it out and it's more popular than the New York Times. Like she has 6 million followers, I think. No, no, she, she has like 12 or 13. 12 million followers on Twitter alone. Part of the thesis of the book was that the closing ranks around Omar to go from explicitly condemning Omar and her remarks to we're going to explicitly condemn bigotry of any kind that anyone has ever said and not <laughs> name her in the House resolution or resolutions around it. That was the turning point which showed you that the Democrat Party is all in and embracing the regressive progressives because either they think that that's where the party is going and that's where the power is or the party is already there. And I was writing this a couple years ago and they're, they're there, I would say. Right. Now, the other thing worth noting just on the media point briefly, tangentially is why is it always that it's just the Daily Mail that reports on Hunter Biden and Ilhan Omar? Notice how there are no domestic publications that ever delve into any of these things. I mean, with rare exceptions. It's, it's you know, the New York Post, obviously, right. with Hunter Biden. But that said, how, why do you have to go to the Daily Mail to get your news about Ilhan Omar? Isn't that kind of strange? Yeah, you know, it, what's, it's fascinating, too, is uh, Daily Mail is not bad. Uh, the left hates them, and they're always acting like it's, it's fake news or whatever. But they typically have some of the most comprehensive breakdowns of news stories. You'll find they have four or five thousand words on a single story that the Hill will have three hundred on, and the, and then they'll and then they'll attach you know related stories with like background information. I'm I'm, I'm rather impressed by that. It's a British company, Daily Mail. Daily Mail, yeah, it's yeah. Murdoch too, right? It's, I think so. I, I think go, so. I would, and and they had people on the ground for Ilhan Omar. There were like three journalists in the country, maybe, who were looking at her, and they were dogged in covering the Omar beat. I was so. a big fan of Al Jazeera getting my Middle East uh, news because I would read a lot of American propaganda, and then I'd go and read Al Jazeera and see like, oh, there's a lot more going on than what I'm getting fed by the American media. Mainstream Probably. media is um, what's the word I'm thinking of? Um, refuse, hmm. is, debris, is, 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 debris, is flotsam. <laughs> Most you know. of it. It's confusing well, the flotsam there's is like coming. bits of they gold in the, in the sewage. And you're like, how do I get it out? But it's so effective, though. The hysteria, and I'm sure we'll talk about the coronavirus stuff, but the oh, yeah. hysteria engendered around it, where we were talking before the show that it's sort of like in 9-11, after 9-11, people watching the TV every day. And I remember that. I was a kid, and, and I remember being glued to it every day. And you can see how people get whipped up to the point where we're talking about potentially mandating an experimental use drug, whatever you think about it, and you might think it's the greatest thing in the world or you might be skeptical of it, mandating at the point of a government gun, figuratively, injecting yourself with an emergency use anything that hasn't been tested over a long period of time. And that's just normal in 2021 America. Well, the, the worrying thing about that is just mandating something that a doctor could say you can't get. You, like you, you go to your doctor and the doctor says, I recommend no because you have underlying medical conditions. And now what? Now you can't go to the movies anymore? Apparently. Me. Yep. San Francisco and New Orleans and New York. I think one other city. So, yeah, I mean, it's been it's been uh, you, you know, what it is, though. It's not necessarily the media. It is. But there's another component. It is the tribal cult like 
mentality these people have. It's authoritarianism, right? It's this strict adherence to the collective. And so if the mass says so, they will just do it. They will, that they want it. And they have their brown shirts, right? So it, it's like with, with, you know, Mayo Gate, we're calling it. They, they, they will, they know that it's stochastic terrorism. I guess that's what they call it, right? They like to accuse the right of doing it. And the idea is that Trump would come out and say something like, oh, won't someone rid me of this priest? And then someone would go do it. He never directed him to do it. Hmm. The idea is that if you say a bunch of things enough, people will just take action. So you don't overtly tell people to do it. In this instance, it's exactly what's happening with, with the left. They'll come out and say, look at these restaurants. They're liars. They're evil. They, they, they're, they're far right because they know someone will then go attack them. And I've heard so many stories like this from conservatives where they're like, uh, they'll get a smear piece. Next thing you know, their, their phone's ringing off the hook. They're, they're getting kicked off social media. They've got people showing up at their houses. This has been going on for some time. And I'll tell you, it's like, a, it's like the rules for radicals, man. They accuse the Republicans and the right and the anti-establishment of doing exactly what they do. They, they, they project that because it's an effective offense. Then when you come back and there's like a regular person not paying attention, you say, look, look what they're doing. They'll be like, they said you were doing that first. And so then they just they, they get away with that it, tendency to believe the first thing you hear. If you hear a, a bunch of information, it's a lot of times it's the first one you hear that's like codes the mind, you know, the mental pathways. And then there it is. Also, no one sees the correction. They always see the story that gets spun out and then repeated a trillion times. And the lie told a trillion times before you get to the truth. Well, what's going to win? I'll, I'll, I'll give you a really good example of how this manifests in real life. Um, whoever calls the police first tends to win. So if Ian and I get into a fight and then I call the police, and I, I say tends to because it doesn't always work that way. And then I say, hey, I need help. This guy did this. When the cops show up and then I give a statement, I'm the one who called. I have the benefit of the doubt. There's actually uh, con artists exploit this. Well, what you do is I don't, I don't, I don't want to get into the full tricks. I think we've talked about it before, but con artists will do a trick where they will call the police on you and then get the cops to rob you for them. Because you called the cops, the cops will typically. So there's some information gathering you need first. There's some tricks, which I'm not going to explain because I don't want anyone to go and do this. Mm -hmm. But yes, one of a very common hustle is to call the police on somebody. The cops will then search the person and then give over their possessions to That's you. That's wild. Yep, yep, yep. Whoever calls the cops first wins. I've been in, I've been in, I, I've had this, I've personally experienced situations like this where I've been the victim of a crime, but they turned my phone off and then called the police on me and then the cops came and arrested call me. It appeal to authority? Is that an argument tactic? Mm -hmm. an argument uh, tactic? And I, I, the yeah. cops tell me like, what are we supposed to do? Every time we show up, arrest both people? And I'm like, I called the cops first, but they turned my phone off. They took my phone and they hung up on it. They, they canceled it and then they called and the cops came and arrested me. There's an element of that in the media. That's a thing, right? So the Democrats will be like, the Republicans are extremist terrorists. Then Antifa goes around smashing and destroying everything and they say, well, it's self-defense because the Republicans are terrorists. <laughs> also, I mean, Leftist ideology has lent itself historically to being violent and at the a point of a gun imposing your belief because it, there's coercion that's necessarily built into it. If you won't go along, we're going to have to make you go along. And it's for your own good also, by the way. I mean, who's ever heard of limited government, live and let live people having bloody anti-cultural revolutions? Has that ever existed in the history well, of mankind? I don't this, think so. I, I like to use some of these analogies. You know, why is it that conservatives are more likely to get banned on social media? Uh, if 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 I told you that uh, Dave Rubin would be rallying a bunch of you know black clad masked far right extremists to Twitter HQ, and would be smashing out windows and stuff, would you believe it? No, no, of course not. A joke. It's not gonna. But if I told you that uh, uh, you know Antifa, some left wing organizers were gonna be showing up with Molotovs and crowbars to Twitter H HQ, would you believe it? Yeah, yeah, of course. So what do you think Jack Dorsey thinks when he's got his finger over the ban button? He's like, I could ban the right all day and night. They ain't going to do anything about it. I ban one leftist and they'll show up here with a brick. Nah, I don't, I don't want to deal with that. Plus, they're in the Bay Area. So they're like, we, the last thing we need <laughs> is all these people storming the camp. Just get rid of the conservatives. But not to mention they're in the Bay Area. They probably agree with Antifa to a great extent. Yeah. Yeah. There's also, I feel like, a little bit of a self-loathing element to it, too. Like, how do they reconcile their leftism with their material success and, like, all the trappings that they have? There's probably a deep-seated psychological, not that I have any expertise in this, and that maybe that'll get me banned. Uh, but <laughs> but that said, I do think that the, the deep-seated narcissistic psychological part of it is probably uh, discounted to an extent it shouldn't be. Thanks for checking out this clip from the TimCast IRL podcast. If you want to see the full show, come back to this channel, youtube.com slash TimCast IRL, Monday through Friday at 8 p.m., where you can leave comments and super chat. 
and we actually will read your comments on the show. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe. And if you want exclusive members only content segments you can't get anywhere else, go to TimCast.com, become a member, and we even have full bonus episodes. Thanks for hanging out, and we'll see you all next time.